Hi everyone, my name is Kevin Leung from New York City Emergency Management, and today we'll be having our May Ready Up New York City webinar presenting travel preparedness uh, with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and New York City Emergency Management. AJ, if we could get to the next slide, please. Awesome. So just to give off a quick mission statement, New York City Emergency Management, uh, our main goal is to really help New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies through preparedness, education, and response. The agency is responsible for coordinating citywide emergency planning and response for all types of scales and emergencies, and is staffed by more than 200 dedicated professionals with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise, including individuals assigned from other city agencies, such as the fire department, the police department, and the department of buildings, and et cetera. So we have a lot of people working together to make sure that New, York, New Yorkers are safe and the city is safe as well. And just to begin things off, we want to have people be prepared. And how, how can you be prepared? Be prepared is by downloading the My Emergency Plan uh, from nyc.gov slash readyny. This plan is all encompassing and it really is just a one-stop shop for you and your family to be prepared, allowing you the right tools, the right tips, and also the right mindset to know what to do when an emergency happens. So you don't have to scramble and think on the fly when an emergency does happen, you are properly prepared with all the things necessary to make sure that your family is safe. And within that, and within the My Emergency Plan, there are basically three steps. You have making a plan, gathering supplies and staying informed. Making a plan makes, basically tells you what are the right steps or it's a list of things that you and your family have to do in order to be safe or properly be prepared for any type of emergency. Gathering supplies or getting together the right things that you need that are specific for you and your family. Uh, supplies and things can be different from family to family, from person to person. A man is different from a woman and a woman is different from a child. So in terms of supplies, please think about what you and your family need, not what you read online, but what caters to the situation that you and your family are in. And, and after being able to have a plan and gathering the right supplies, we always want to stay informed. We want to know what is the next step on how to be prepared what is the best information to receive when an emergency does happen and how can we access it and make sure that it is incorporated into our personal emergency preparedness plan. So just to begin off, that is basically a quick one, two, three on how to be prepared in New York City. Uh, I really wanted to, to give most of our time to uh, Ms. Allison Taylor Walker. She is going to be presenting for us. She attended Northwestern University. She completed a master's of public health degree at Emory University and a PhD in global disease epidemiology and control at John Hopkins University. She joined the CDC in 2005 and has worked on almost all continents for global health programs at the CDC. Her work includes serving as CDC subject matter expert for polio eradication in the Horn of Africa, conducting research in the field of global multi-drug resistance tuberculosis, studying the transmission of and response of global waterborne diseases, and served as epidemiology team lead for the Travelers Health Task Force for, for the Zika response, and lead for Travelers Health in the COVID-19 response. Uh, Allison is currently a senior epidemiologist and leads the epidemiology and surveillance team in the Travelers Health branch at the CDC. So safe to say she is amazing and awesome, and she uh, can provide us with all the information on how to be prepared when we travel. And uh, Allison, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that was quite the introduction. I don't, uh, don't know if I can live up to it, but uh, we'll see. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for inviting me to participate in this session and to talk about travel preparedness during COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. I have no disclosures. Next slide, please. So on this graph, you can see the three major COVID-19 surges that have occurred in the United States. And every surge follows a holiday where travel has increased. Next slide, please. 
In the first months of the pandemic, travel decreased dramatically as the borders began to close. Next slide, please. But recently, travel's picked up. And a survey conducted in early May by destination analysts of over 1,200 American travelers showed that 77% were either already traveling or ready to start traveling. And this slide shows a decrease in the number of people at TSA checkpoints from 2019 to 2020, and then the increase from 2020 to 2021. Next slide, please. There are many tools that have been used to try to reduce travel associated transmission, and these include border closings, testing, quarantine, and vaccines, to name a few. Some work better than others. For example, data have shown that temperature and symptom screening at airports detected very few COVID-19 cases, but required considerable resources. The yield was approximately one case per 85,000 travelers screened. So due to the nature of the disease, many people who spread SARS-CoV-2 are not symptomatic. So temperature screening, uh, temperature and symptom screening are not effective at identifying them. Next slide, please. So what do I need to think about when I'm planning travel? So when thinking about risk, it's important to separate risk at your destination from your individual level risk. Next, please. Destination level risk is most important as an outbound travel tool for use by travelers and their doctors and healthcare providers to decide whether to travel to a destination. Considerations include COVID-19 case rates, testing availability, healthcare capacity, circulating variants, and vaccination coverage. And this information is provided by CDC for international travel destinations and our travel health notices. CDC advises that even fully vaccinated travelers pay close attention to the current situation at their destination before traveling internationally. The travel health notice is a great place to start. COVID-19 travel recommendations can be found on the interactive world map showing COVID-19 travel recommendations by destination. Um, and the travel health notices on this page give travelers information about the COVID situation at destinations around the world. There are also travel health notices on individual destination pages that give you up-to-date information on other health risks and ways to stay safe and make the most of your trip. When you follow the link at the bottom of this page, it'll take you to a full page reminding you of all the steps you can take to prepare to stay safe and healthy while traveling. This includes seeing your doctor or healthcare provider four to six weeks before your trip so that you can be sure that you're up to date on all of the vaccines that are recommended or required by your destination. And depending on your destination, you may also need prescriptions for medicines that will prevent malaria, which is carried by mosquitoes. And speaking of mosquitoes, it's also really important to bring along long sleeves and pants and bug spray to prevent bites and infections and other diseases that mosquitoes carry if this is a risk at your destination. And these pages will also include tips on staying safe and healthy during travel, like safe food and water recommendations, and prevention of other diseases that might be common at your destination. Shown here on the bottom right is a travel health notice for COVID-19 specifically in India, which is the highest level four, indicating that travelers should avoid all travel to India at the current time. Next, please. So CDC uses primary and secondary data sets to determine COVID-19 travel health notice levels. Primary data include the total case counts and case trajectory information provided mostly by overseas ministries of health directly to the World Health Organization. And CDC relies on sources such as the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics and Our World in Data and Ministry of Health websites for secondary criteria data. And these include the number of tests conducted per capita and the test to case ratio. And all of these criteria are measured over a 28 day period and reviewed by CDC daily. Changes to travel health notice levels are updated on a weekly basis, and we're constantly adding new data and updating our websites as new information becomes available as more countries are vaccinating more people. So vaccination coverage will also be used to speed up countries de-escalation process or their decrease in travel health notice level if vaccination coverage is high. Next, please. As shown by all the red on this map, travel health notice levels for COVID-19 are very high at many locations. Around 80% are at level four. What accounts for this is likely the loosening of control measures, low vaccination coverage in many countries, or an increase in variants of concern that are more transmissible. Next, please. So now we'll look at some individual actions that you can think through when considering travel. Some COVID-19 questions to ask yourself when considering travel or will I be able to get tested or stay home after travel if I need to? Am I fully vaccinated? Am I likely to get severe disease because of my age or health status? 
And how likely am I to wear a mask, keep distance from others, avoid crowds, and wash my hands? Next, please. So have you been fully vaccinated? You're considered fully vaccinated two weeks after your second dose in a two-dose series, such as Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, or two weeks after a single dose, uh, two single dose vaccines, such as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But if you don't meet these requirements, regardless of age, you are not fully vaccinated. So this at the current time would include all children under 12. If you are fully vaccinated, you don't have to get tested before leaving the US unless your destination requires it. You do not have to self-quarantine after you arrive in the US. And before travel, you should understand and follow all airline and destination requirements relating to travel, testing, masking, or quarantine, which may differ from US requirements. If you do not follow your destination's requirements, you may be denied entry and may be required to return to the US. During travel, all air passengers coming to the US, including US citizens and fully vaccinated people, are required to have a negative COVID-19 test no more than three days before their travel or documentation of recovery from COVID-19 in the past three months before they board a flight to the United States. And after travel, you should get tested with a viral test three to five days after travel, self-monitor for COVID-19 symptoms, isolate and get tested if you develop symptoms and follow all state and local recommendations and requirements. Do not travel if you are exposed to COVID-19 and are not vaccinated or don't have documentation of recovery in the past three months. If you're sick, tested positive for COVID-19 or are waiting for results of a COVID-19 test. Learn when it's safe for you to travel on the CDC website and don't travel with someone who's sick. For those who are not yet fully vaccinated, CDC recommends you get tested one to three days before travel, three to five days after your journey, and quarantine for seven days if you get tested, or for 10 days if you don't get a test post-journey. Everyone, vaccinated or not, should self-monitor for symptoms and wear a mask and take other precautions during travel. Next slide, please. So I just mentioned a very important requirement for you to be able to return to the United States, so we'll go over it one more time. So during travel, all air passengers, regardless of vaccine status, must get tested with a viral test no more than three days before boarding a flight to the US. You must show a negative test result to the airline before boarding, or if you've recovered from COVID-19 in the past 90 days, you may show documentation of recovery, a positive test result, and a letter clearing you for travel. Remember that this applies to both vaccinated and unvaccinated passengers, so be prepared and plan ahead, and be sure that you know how and where to get tested so that the result will be available in time for your flight. Next slide, please. Another requirement to be aware of as you prepare to travel either internationally or domestically is the mask requirement. Wearing a mask on planes, buses, trains, and other forms of public transportation traveling into, within, or out of the United States and inside the US transportation hubs, such as airports and stations. Again, this applies to both vaccinated and unvaccinated persons. Next slide, please. For travel within the United States, fully vaccinated travelers do not need to get tested pre and post travel or self quarantine after travel. CDC recommends uh, those who are not yet vaccinated get tested one to three days before travel, three to five days after your journey, and quarantine for seven days if you get tested and 10 days if you don't get tested post journey. Everyone vaccinated or not should self monitor for symptoms, wear a mask, and take other precautions during travel. Next, please. No matter where you're going, do not travel if you're exposed to COVID-19 unless you're fully vaccinated or recovered in the past 90 days, are sick, test positive for COVID-19, or awaiting test results, and don't travel with someone who's sick. Next, please. For families traveling with children who cannot yet get vaccinated, you should follow recommendations for unvaccinated people and choose the safer travel options. Remember to keep your distance and wear a mask, wash hands frequently with soap and water, or use hand sanitizer while traveling. As we said earlier, fully vaccinated means two weeks past your final vaccine dose, regardless of age. So now we'll walk through safer and less safe options for transportation, accommodations, food, and camping, as well as what to avoid when traveling. Next slide, please. So starting with transportation, the key point to remember is that frequent stops and layovers may not allow for distancing from others. So safer options include short road trips with members of your own family um, or the, that are within your household or fully vaccinated people and having few stops along the way. 
And if you must fly, try to take flights with the fewest stops or layovers. Less safe options include longer trips by car or RV with many stops along the way. Um, trips, with, trips by car or RV with people who are not vaccinated or not from your household and flights with layovers. Currently, CDC recommends avoiding long distance train or bus trips and traveling on a cruise ship or riverboat. Preparing for travel isn't just about the risks at your destination. And as we see here, the journey to and from your destination may pose risks that are important to plan for also. Next, please. So now we'll turn to accommodations. Checking the COVID-19 prevention practices at your destination can help you to make safer choices. Safer options include staying in a house or cabin, for example, a vacation rental with people from your household or fully vaccinated people, and visiting fully vaccinated family members friends, or friends' homes. Examples of less safe options would be hotels or multi-unit guest lodgings with common areas like bed and breakfast, visiting an unvaccinated family member or friend's home, and renting or staying in a house or cabin, for example, a vacation rental with people who are not vaccinated or in your household. And try to avoid sharing spaces with many people to, or sharing bathroom facilities, for example, in a dormitory style hostel. Next slide, please. When we talk about travel in my family, we always talk about food and planning ahead for meals can help you follow safe practices on your trip. Safer options include bringing your own food and drinks and getting takeout or using drive-through delivery and curbside options and wearing a mask when interacting with restaurant employees. Less safe options include eating outside at a restaurant where social distancing is possible and service and other staff wear masks, eating inside at a restaurant that is well ventilated where social distancing is possible and servers and other restaurants staff wear masks and diners wear masks when not actively eating or drinking. And we recommend avoiding eating inside restaurants that are poorly ventilated where social distancing is not possible, service and staff do not wear masks and diners do not wear masks when actively eating or drinking. Self-service options that require extensive touching of surf surfaces may also be avoided such as buffets. So personally, I love the beach. So any destination near the ocean is a good one for me. And now that I'm fully vaccinated, I have plans to travel to the coast with my family later this summer, and I'll be choosing the safer travel options on my trip. And we'll drive without stopping and bring our own food in the car and stay in a vacation rental that gives us plenty of space to relax without putting us in close contact with others outside our household. And the beach is a perfect place for us because we love to be outside and bike and run and swim in the open air. And it's really easy for us to maintain our distance and choose delivery and curbside options from local grocery stores and restaurants. I just need to set a reminder for myself to pack enough sunscreen and bug spray. So if you enjoy camping or you're planning to, on trying it for the first time, <laughs> this is another location where sunscreen and bug spray are must haves for mosquitoes and other uh, vectors that bite like ticks. The safer options include camping with people who are fully vaccinated or from your household only and not sharing facilities with persons outside your household. An example of less safe options include camping with people who are fully vaccinated or people from your house, uh, household only but sharing facilities with people outside of your household where distancing of at least six feet is not possible. Sharing tents or cabins with family or friends who are not vaccinated or in your household. Um, and interacting outside with people who are not wearing masks but are keeping six feet apart. And try to avoid camping in large dormitory style settings um, with many people in shared facilities. Interacting outside or indoors with people who are not wearing masks and are not keeping six feet of distance is also not a great idea. So globally, we're seeing positive signs emerge as more and more people get vaccinated. In Israel, the increasing percent of the population fully vaccinated correlated over time with a decreasing number of cases daily. And this may be because fully vaccinated people are at low risk of symptomatic and severe COVID-19, or because fully vaccinated people are less likely to have asymptomatic infection or transmit SARS-CoV-2 to others. So we've just gone over a whole bunch of different topics, and I'll just summarize by saying that travel increases the spread and movement of SARS-CoV-2 and emerging variants of concern. And CDC uses data-driven approaches to assess COVID-19 risks at destinations and to provide recommendations to travelers for COVID-19 and other health risks. Travelers should consider both the COVID-19 situation at their destinations using travel health notices and their own and their traveling companions' individual risks when planning travel. And this includes choosing safer options as you think through transportation, accommodations, food, and activities. 
And I'll end by saying that everyone should be fully vaccinated before travel. And this most certainly applies to COVID-19 vaccines, but also to all vaccines recommended or required by your destination. Being prepared for travel lets you enjoy the experience and helps to minimize worries about your health and safety on your journey to end at your destination. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the many people who contributed to this presentation and especially Dr. Cindy Friedman from the Travelers Health Branch at CDC. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Awesome, that was absolutely amazing. Um, Allison, thank you so much for being, being able to do this for us. I've learned so much now more on how to be safe and how to travel during these times. Um, and now I really want to open up the floor uh, for everyone here to uh, really ask any questions that they have or if they have any additional things that they want to talk about. Um, a couple of questions that I can ask for everyone, I mean, that I can answer for everyone is yes, this, this will be, um, these slides will be PDF and sent to everyone so they can see it. Um, it will be timestamped with the most relevant information as of today, which is uh, May 27th, 2021. Um, so please, if for the most up-to-date information, please go to the CDC website. Please come to New York City Emergency Management's website to get the most, most, um, most information. So, Allison, there's a question with the possibility of mutations in COVID-19. Are there any concerns reopening international travel as international airports can present a hub of entry to unknown strains? So this is something that we're following very closely. Um, and the vaccines appear to be very effective against the COVID-19 variants we are seeing currently. But obviously we're always uh, doing more and more studies and the situation changes. Um, and as new things are discovered, Things are opening up now, but they may change again in the future. We never know what's going to happen next. This virus um, has surprised us before and hopefully won't again, but we never know. Um, so these are things that CDC is tracking very closely, and we would um, update all of our guidance according to anything that we find. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, this one, uh, there's another question with can we get the slide deck today so we can amplify it to our communities before the holiday weekend? Uh, we will try to get it to you this week uh, for the slide deck. Uh, unfortunately, if we get it to you this week, we might not be able to get you the the presentation of the recording um, just because it does take a couple of days for us to uh, put it onto our social media. But uh, yes, if, um, if you guys do want the slide deck this week so you can get it over the weekend, we will send it over so you guys can give it to your communities before the, the long weekend and the travel weekend. Uh, the next question is who will track the test results from travelers, the airlines? So currently, um, the airlines have to check the test result to allow you to board. If you don't have one, you won't be allowed to board. Um, and CDC uh, verifies that everyone entering the U.S. has a negative test result or documentation of uh, recovery within 90 days. We work closely to do, with partners to do this. Awesome. Thank you so much for this. Um, there is a couple questions on on the Excelsior vaccine passport. I'm not too sure you're familiar with it because it's more of a New York State thing. Um, but it is yeah. like a state passport in terms of things. Is, there, is that something you can elaborate on? No, uh, unfortunately, that's not uh, that's not something that we handle at the federal level. So uh, that it, would be a it. good question for New York State. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I, uh, I figured. Uh, so, so for whoever's asking about that, please email us at uh, NYC, um, at NYC Emergency Management. So ready at nyc.gov, ready at oem.nyc.gov. Uh, please give us the email there and we can answer your questions via email. Uh, we'll get a better answer for you from, from, um, from the Department of Health over here. Uh, another question is, how are airlines being trained to screen negative COVID tests before being allowed to board? Um, so we have a quarantine branch at uh, the Centers for Disease Control that handles all of our um, uh, disease uh, surveillance and uh, 
transiting uh, international travel at the airports. Um, so they're working very closely with multiple partners to, to implement this. And we have a, a hotline at CDC to answer any questions from airlines as they arrive. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, and this is actually more of a situational question for you is if someone goes to, let's say the Bahamas, took a test showing they don't have COVID, is the same test good to come back to New York? If they go for less than three days, yes. Um, but that test, to board the plane back to New York, you'd have to have a test within uh, three days of your departing flight from the Bahamas. Awesome. Um, so there is, uh, there is another question is oop, uh, is there any limit on the charges for testing for the return to the U.S.? I am not I, aware, but I can I can look that up and get back to you. I I don't know. Uh, I think there there may be differences depending on your destination and and the systems that they're in, but I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on that one. Got it. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. I don't see that many more questions coming up. We'll give it a couple more minutes to see. If anyone has any other questions. Oh, is the CDC expecting a surge after this holiday weekend travel? Um, we're hoping not. Uh, the vaccines <laughs> appear to be very effective, but if everyone follows the the uh, recommendations that we just went through, and hopefully there won't be transmission during travel. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, there's another question where, how are airlines verifying test results if the, uh, if the test results are legitimate? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and I'll have to check with the quarantine branch for the specifics and get back to you. Thank you so much. So. Um, Whoever just asked that question, please give us an email at uh, readyny at oem.nyc.gov, uh, and we will get back to you specifically on that question as well. Uh, let's see. Do you, um, on the CDC map, the US is red and considered a level four. Do you expect that to change sometime soon? So we all hope for change. Um, the the level of the US is calculated in the same way as all of the other country levels. And we use our uh, incidence rate or the cases per 100,000 as a national average to determine what level we're at, as well as the testing data, how many people are being tested and what proportion of those tests are positive. So as soon as we hit the indicators for a lower level, we will be a lower level. And we hope that that's soon as more and more people get vaccinated. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think this is a pretty quick webinar today. Um, I don't see any more questions. Oh, I have one more. Uh, we could do a couple more questions, um, but there's another question. After travel, you need to make a test three days later. Who, who will check that you did it? Is that still mandatory here? So that's not mandatory, it's a recommendation. And that's to be sure um, that you are not bringing COVID back to your home community. So it's something that we ask people to do to keep themselves, their families and their community safe. But no one will check on that. And yeah, and this is, this is for all uh, the residents of New York City, uh, we are still offering tests um, and they are available uh, at all New York City locations. Uh, and you could just Google or you could go online to kind of find out where you can get tested for uh, COVID-19. And um, I just got tested a couple weeks ago uh, and the line was pretty short. I think I waited in line only for five, 10 minutes and that was kind of to get all my paperwork in. So yeah, um, it's still available, readily available and any New York City location is still free of charge. New York City sponsored location, sorry.
uh, will there be increased CDC messaging at airports and other sites during the Memorial Day weekend? So CDC always works with partners to reach out and try and get our messages to, to those who can benefit from them. And I think that this is a perfect example of how we're doing that right before the Memorial Day weekend. Um, so there will be, uh, there always are, I should say, uh, outreach in, in many ways from CDC to, to make people aware of uh, how to mitigate their risks and how to make, uh, make all of the choices in terms of travel and other things safer in, in the time of COVID and beyond. Awesome, thank you so much. So at the moment, it is 2.05 right now. Um, I don't see any other, too many questions. Oh, here's another one. Do you have tips for messaging around pandemic fatigue? So I know it's it's been a long time. restrictions and wants to get back to, to the life that we used to live. Um, and it's totally understandable. And there is certainly a light at the end of the tunnel. But I would say that it's really important not to stop now. We're so close. Um, and if we can continue for just a little while longer and until enough people get vaccinated and rates really come down, um, I think that the benefit is well worth it. So, um, I know that there's a uh, there are a lot of people asking the same question about when we can stop everything and getting vaccinated is a great step to doing that. Yeah, that's a really, really good, good answer. And thank you so much, Allison, for that. I also want to build on that question as well is um, we all understand that it's been, it's been rough for everyone. Uh, everyone has been affected some way somehow by COVID-19. Um, and we do understand that mental health is one of the biggest um, things that comes from um, being cooped up at home for so long. And, and we really want people to be well, not just physically, but mentally here in New York City and around the country. So if you do live in New York City, please, we urge you to text WELL, W-E-L-L, -L, to 65173. Um, or if you want, we do have a mental health hotline where you can call. It's a 1-888-NYC. Well, W E L L, and that's also something I'll send out in the follow-up emails. Uh, if anyone needs any support in that, please, please give them a call. Please chat with them. You can also visit NYC Well online, uh, and it is a resource that is available to everyone to use uh, to to be safe and to be um, to be physically well and mentally well. Um, are there any future plans at authorizing faster COVID-19 test kits to get results, uh, as many locations do not honor the quick 15-minute kit results? So there are, um, there's a lot of, you know, research and capacity building happening right now in terms of testing. Um, so. I think change, there, there are going to be changes in the future. And as uh, COVID-19 moves from this uh, epidemic stage into lower levels, hopefully soon, um, we're going to see differences in testing. We're going to see new things come to market. I think a lot of it is driven um, in the private sector. CDC is working on uh, a lot of the laboratory uh, pieces of this as well. So I think there's definitely more to come and this will be an ongoing uh, issue that we're, we deal with and, and we'll have new tools to, to work with in the future. Thank you, thank you for that. All right, um, I'll give everyone a couple more minutes. Uh, I think we can stop this around 8.10, I mean, um, 210 um, and we can um, go from there. If anyone has any last questions they want to ask, uh, ask them now or forever hold your peace. Uh, there was a quick question. Uh, are we expecting a surge after the Memorial Day weekend? Uh, this was just uh, answered, um, but again, it is something where we 
we want to, uh, we don't, we don't expect it to, uh, again, because of this great presentation that we had, uh, but also please follow all safety guidelines that the CDC recommends. And if I can just add, you can always ask questions to CDC. We'll answer them. I'll answer them personally if they're about travel, um, me and my team. And uh, you can send uh, your questions to cdc.gov or CDC in CDC info at cdc.gov. Um, and, and you can ask questions about any, any of the things we've discussed today or other topics. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, there's a couple questions that they want to ask uh, via the phone. Uh, the first one is Patricia Lewis. Uh, you are allowed to talk. Please uh, unmute yourself if you can. Um, mm. And yeah, you can ask your question. My question was well, the Excelsior passport, and that was answered. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see the hand not, raised. Not to worry. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Um, I, I have a further question, but I think I have to call New York City to find out. Yes, if, if you have any questions for that, please just give us an email uh, and we could try to connect you to the right resources or you can call 311. Okay, but let me float the question. Oh, sure. if, one was, if one was vaccinated in another state rather than their home state, is that an issue as far as getting these vaccination documentation? Thanks for that question. Um, Allison, would you be able to answer that? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I live in New York City. I was vaccinated in another state, not New York State. So does that present a problem for my getting documentation to prove my vaccination status? So you should have received the white CDC card to prove your vaccination I, status? Sorry? Yeah, I have that. Mm -hmm. um, that so that, that's the federal, that's the, the federal document. Um, I don't know how that would impact uh, the, the New York State specific. Um, okay. Passes. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Mr. Leon. Thank you so much. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions. Uh, it seems like everyone is happy enough. I hope everyone is great. Um, again, Allison, thank you so much for being here, allowing us to have your time to really talk about travel preparedness and uh, working with New York City Emergency Management on that. And uh, again, I'm so grateful for you to be here and uh, it is an amazing time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for helping us get the message out. We want everyone to travel safely. Yes, yes. And uh, if you ever need anything else from us, please let us know and we are there to support. Um, also, again, thank you, Allison Sussman for really being there as well to kind of make the connection happen. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending and thank you AJ uh, for being our slide guru. Uh, if anyone else has any other questions, please direct it to us at readynyc, uh, at readyny at oem.nyc.gov. And thank you and have a great day.